Hello, how's it going? I think I know most of you. If I don't know you, my name's Brian. Um, he asked me if there's any interesting facts that I wanted him to share, and I said, no, there's not really interesting anything interesting about me. So that's the interesting fact, I guess. Um, well, yeah, if you don't know me, I'd love to meet you. Again, my name is Brian Hamilton. Um, I graduated from Chico State, studied finance and accounting, and that's not that interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> Designed to change, we're talking about. Designed to change. And actually, it's really encouraging. I had the thought while we were worshiping, I don't even need to share this message with you because you were all proclaiming out loud, if I'm not dead, you're not done. And that's really the message of change is that God wants to continually change your life and you should continually engage the process of changing. I wasn't planning on saying any of that. I want to start by telling you the most loving, inclusive, accepting, empowering thing that I could possibly tell you tonight. Are you ready? You are not perfect just the way you are. You should not follow your heart. You will be happiest if you do not stay true to yourself. You were designed to change. And God does love you immensely, infinitely, just the way that you are. And he loves you enough, so much, that he wants progress for your life. He wants you to change. He wants you to experience something better for your life. God did make you perfectly. He, he uniquely designed every single one of you with this perfect plan for your life. And in that perfect plan for your life, the design is that you would grow over the course of your entire life to a point of reaching perfection in heaven. We're not perfect now. We need to change. Uh, and, and, and you won't be happiest if you are true to yourself. You'll be happiest if you are true to who God made you to be which is absolutely possible with his help as you engage the process of transformation. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who's heard that verse before? I thought most of you had probably heard that verse before. Uh, most of us are familiar with that. If you've been around Challenge or church or, or read the Bible very much, you've probably heard that verse before. Um, we are designed to change. And God actually in this verse is commanding us to change, to grow, to continually experience more of him. And a part of that desire is, is actually for you that you would get to experience his perfect will his perfect purpose, his perfect plan. It is by changing that you get to experience, that you get to test, put to the test, and ultimately approve what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is. Uh, and, and that's possible if you experience change, if you experience transformation. So you might be familiar with this verse and even this idea. Honestly, I think that if you've been a Christian for a little while, you, you probably uh, are embracing the, the, the desire to change. You recognize, you, if, you, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit comes to convict you of truth, to remind you of truth, to guide you in a life shaped by truth. And so if you're a Christian, you probably already have this, some desire at least, to change, to grow. The Bible calls that sanctification. Um, but even if you're familiar with that, even if you want that, uh, even if you are, are looking for that, the reality is you also live in the world. And so you're constantly influenced by the world. You can't not be influenced by the world. I'm influenced by the world around me. So whether you recognize it or not, you just need to be careful with, with the culture that you're influenced by. And right now, at this point in history, in, in th at this point in society and in culture, uh, there are some extremely dangerous ideas really regarding our emotion and how we deal with our emotions um, that if you're not careful, they will hinder you from growing. 
if you were to buy into these worldly ideas, it would actually block you from being able to grow. Uh, and so that's what I want to look at tonight. I want to look at a few of these ideas um, so that we can help get our sights set on the truth that can actually lead us to transformation. So I want to cover a few things. Uh, I'm just going to kind of chat through this, teach through this a little bit, and then I'll have some practical application for you. Dangerously wrong ideas of the world. So remember, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here are some patterns of the world you need to watch out for. Wrong idea number one, my feelings are the real me. I feel, therefore I am. Have you noticed that people have become defined by their feelings? Uh, and this is kind of followed by uh, a statement, whether said or not, that, that's kind of along the lines of, I have no choice or control over how I feel. How I feel is my reality and my feelings are justified by my circumstances or experiences. And the problem with that is that how an individual, how you as an individual experiences something is an interpretation of reality, but it is not always an accurate interpretation of reality. And so if, if you were to live based on how something makes you feel, based on an interpretation of reality that is incorrect, it would then become a functional reality in your life, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Ultimately, whether your interpretation of reality is accurate or not, you can't make progress if you hold yourself hostage to the way that something makes you feel. Wrong idea number two. My feelings accurately reflect reality. So you can see how these are building on each other. I feel, therefore it's true. I feel this way, therefore it must be true. Because I have no control over how I feel, what I feel is the truth. And the longer I feel that way, the truer it is for me. And that's reinforcing a potential lie depending on your interpretation of reality or depending on how helpful it is for your progress. Wrong idea number three. I must listen to, express, and obey my feelings. Do you see this? Is this making sense? You see this in culture, in the world around you, students in class. I feel, therefore, I must act. And this is what you would call expressive individualism. My feelings are the true me and I must express them in order to be true to myself. Do you see that? Seriously. The, the reality is we're, we are broken. Our sinfulness, our sinful nature that we all have in us has warped God's true design. We aren't made to become what we feel. And ultimately, we can't trust what we feel anyways, and we'll get to that. Wrong idea number four, and this is building, and this is where we've arrived at society today. Others must understand, accept, and validate my feelings. I feel, I feel, therefore you must accommodate my feelings. And this is putting it all together. My feelings are the real me. They accurately reflect reality. I must obey them and you must accommodate them. And if you don't accommodate my feelings, then you don't really care about me. In fact, you're a hateful person. So now I can mistreat you and it's your fault. Have you seen that in the world? This is where we're at in society today and what it actually is, is justified self-centeredness. And it is all a trap. And it leaves us hopeless and it is actually directly opposed to change, to progress. It makes progress impossible. 
And so I, I call this out for you because whether you realize it or not, you're influenced by this way of thinking. And, and so as the Bible calls us to, to not transform the patterns of the world, but instead to be made new in the attitude of our mind, to be transformed in the attitude of our mind by God's word so that we can experience his perfect will in our lives, we have to be able to see this and we have to be able to resist this ultimately. The truth is we should not follow our heart. Jeremiah 17, nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The world tries to package self-acceptance as a pathway to prosperity when in reality, it is actually the easiest way to experience misery. And it is tragically ironic that society thinks it is loving to say that you don't need to experience growth. And they would never package it that way. They would say you need to be true to yourself. But they are actually saying you don't need to experience progress. The world tries to say actually that it, it, it is hateful of me to say that you should change. When all I'm really saying in that is, I want more for your life. I want you to experience something better. God has something better for you. You know what I actually think is hateful? Telling you that you should settle and stop making progress in life telling you that, that you, you, have, you have peaked as a person and all of these patterns and all of these problems that are causing you misery, it, it's the way that you are and you should love yourself for it. And, and the world doesn't package it that way, but that is what they're actually saying. I think this, this passage of scripture encompasses the idea really well because I think that people recognize their misery. I mean, when, when you have, have you ever felt miserable in life? And has it usually been accompanied with a desire for progress or a desire for change? This is what is so tragically ironic. And by the way, side note, okay. The Bible explains reality. Did you know that? You know, it's sometimes it's easy to go through life and to get caught in the wave and to just think, man, this doesn't make sense. This is so hard. How do I make sense of this? How do I get through this? And, and scripture actually makes sense of reality because God, the creator of the universe, who designed the way that the world actually works, has given us not just a clue, but very clear instruction on how life really works. And so you read this and you observe reality and it makes sense. Second Peter 2, 17 to 22. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are, ju who are just escaping from those who live in air. Catch this part. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn, back, turn their backs on the sacred command that has passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. The unstated tagline of worldly thinking regarding change, regarding progress, the unstated tagline is, we promise you freedom while we ourselves are slaves of depravity. That would be the tagline on the way that the world approaches change for the human heart. We promise you freedom while we ourselves are slaves of depravity. This is where it starts to get hopeful. 
Galatians 6, 8 says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. You want to know what the product is of you following your heart and being true to yourself as a sinful natured being? Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. You get to choose what you will experience in life. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. You know, how, how long is eternity? And, and, and the reality is when this is saying from the spirit, you will reap eternal life, that starts today. Because Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to work in your life and to begin bestowing the blessings of heaven in your life today. And, and it's not perfect and you'll still have your sinful nature to deal with and you'll still have evil in this world that you have to experience the, the, the consequences of. It's going to still be hard. I'm not telling you it's perfect. What I'm saying is the eternal life, the fullness of life that Jesus Christ promised is available to you today as you choose to yield to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life, which means as you choose to change. Our lives are meant to be brought to God, surrendered to Him, given to Him to, to shape and to lead. And our lives are actually meant to experience continuous transformation from one, from one breakthrough to another. That is what God wants for your life. One spiritual breakthrough after another. More than you could ever imagine. And, and so I want to affirm you that God does love you just the way that you are. But he loves you way too much to leave you that way. He wants more for your life. We don't need to change because God doesn't like us. God proved his love for us while we were still sinners. You understand the power of that much love? God proved his infinite, perfect, unconditional love for you by sending Jesus Christ to die for you on the cross. God loves you infinitely. So much so that he wants more for your life. You were designed to change. Change is good. Change leads to a greater joy in life, to a deeper experience of God in your life. Change produces fulfillment in life and peace in life. Change is, is, is ultimately the manifestation of, of hope in Christ in your life today. Change is what we were designed for and change is what we should all pursue relentlessly. And that is a good thing. That is a hopeful thing. That is the most hopeful thing that anyone could ever tell you. Change. So I want to share a few extremely hopeful ideas of the Bible in contrast to the dangerously wrong ideas of the world. Hopeful idea number one, I am made new in Christ. I am made new in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone the new is here. This isn't renovation. This is new life, brand new. So, so you don't need to be defined by your past anymore. You don't need to be defined by your failures or, or your mistakes. You don't need to be, need to be trapped in the, the toxic patterns of your human sinful nature. You don't have to be stuck in that. You don't have to be defined by that. Your current struggles and temptations do not define you anymore. You, you do still have your sinful nature in you and you do still need to work that out. You need to change. But as you do, you also have to recognize the grace and renewal of Jesus Christ. In Titus 3, 5, and 6, it says that you are washed and renewed by the Holy Spirit. So now... You can be defined, you are defined by the glory of God in the grace of Jesus Christ. Hopeful idea number two. 
I can grow to become who God made me to be. I can grow to become who God made me to be. God actually wants to release you, set you free from the burden and the bondage of your sinful nature. Have you ever felt trapped by your sinful nature? If you're not a Christian yet, I love you enough to tell you right now that you are currently trapped. If you are a Christian and you feel trapped, you need to know that you are set free. All you have to do is choose to get up and walk out of the jail cell because it was opened for you. You can walk out of it in the grace of Jesus Christ, but it does require you to get up and move from your current patterns to change. So God wants that for you. He wants to set you free from the burden and bondage of your sinful nature. He actually wants to give you momentum for you to, to experience and to feel momentum in your life as you experience transformation, not to just keep stalling out in your Christian life and, and to keep, as that other verse said, as a dog returns to its vomit. That is not what God wants for you. God wants you to move on, to actually experience separation, distance from your sinful patterns to change for those to no longer be your patterns. He wants you one step at a time to become the complete version of who he really made you to be. And that is absolutely amazing. That means that you can be transformed in your behavior. You can be transformed in your perspectives and your values, how you see life work and what you experience is most important to your life. You can experience transformation in your gifts and your talent. Actually, when you become a Christian and you start growing and you start serving, the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual gifts that can be used for eternal purposes. That is exciting. Your purpose and your pursuits in life are transformed. Even your personality can change and become different in a better way. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And this verse was written to Christians. And so there's some things here that we need to recognize. For example, uh, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. It's really helpful for me to be aware of that. I still experience the corruption of my deceitful desires. The way that the apostle Paul, who is like wrote most of the New Testament, like spiritual gangster, awesome. He says in Romans 7, I keep doing what I don't want to do and I, and I do what I hate and I hate what I do and what I want to do, I don't do and what I don't want to do, I do. I don't get it anymore. Have you been there? God wants progress. And that's where, where Paul goes on further. The very next chapter, he says, you know what? But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ Jesus have been set free from the law of sin and death. I need to stop because I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You have the capacity now as a Christian to grow to become who God actually designed you to be, who God actually made you to be. But it, it does involve your work. You actually have to choose day in and day out to put off your old self and to put on the new self created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. You know that very first day of class? I mean, what do you, wait, how far into school are we, like a week? Uh, two weeks. Who's in their sweatpants in class already? <laughs> yeah, but that first day of class, you were looking good, huh? <laughs> I mean, that first day of class, like you probably did some makeup, yeah. right, fellas? Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that first day of class, you're trying to look good and you get dressed a little bit better than you do. And as the semester goes on, it's like, you slowly start caring what you put on in the morning, finals, it's different. <laughs> that's, that's actually what it looks like. That first day of class, you got up and you intentionally chose what to put on that day. 
And you have to do that in your spiritual life. You have to wake up and you have to choose. You know what? Today, I, I could go choose these other patterns. I could choose this attitude. I could choose this temptation. I could choose this struggle. I, I could put that on today, but I'm actually gonna choose to put on righteousness. I'm gonna choose to put on joy. I'm gonna choose to put on self-control. That is the most appropriate thing for me to wear today. That is the best representation of Jesus Christ. That is most like God in righteousness and holiness. I'm gonna choose to put that on today. That is an intentional choice. And the really beautiful thing is that as you work out your faith, as you choose, God is there to help you. And this is an aspect of sanctification. The Bible calls it spiritual growth that, that actually requires both of you you and God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of God, the glory of the Lord, which by the way, how amazing is it that you being God's creation, broken and sinful as you are, as much as you need to change, you, now that you see Christ, even though you're still imperfect, reflect the glory of God. That's cool. We all who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And we already looked at Romans 12, 2, that says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I think it's really cool that these two verses in scripture, one says, being transformed. The other says, be transformed. If you look at the Greek the original language that this text was written in, vast meaning compared to the English language. Those are the only two verses in all of scripture where this particular word is used to convey the idea of being and be transformed. And why that is so interesting to me is in that particular meaning, we are the object of transformation not the agent of transformation. In both of those, we are the object of transformation and the agent of transformation is the Holy Spirit of God. I think it is so encouraging that God is with you, helping you, guiding you, encouraging you, convicting you and reminding you and shaping you to become holy and righteous. God wants to help you change. You were designed to change. And so we are the object, not the agent of transformation, but we still need to involve ourselves in the process of transformation. So the Holy Spirit doesn't make your work unnecessary. The Holy Spirit makes your work effective. As you work, He gives the power to change. Hopeful idea number three. God will guide me into a life shaped by His truth. God will, not might, God will guide me into a life shaped by his truth. And and it is ultimately his truth that sets you free. It's his truth that fills you with hope and joy. It's his truth that that sets you on a journey in life that is fulfilling and, and eternally valuable. In John 16, 13, Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. I think it is so encouraging that that the Holy Spirit, when I commit my life to Jesus Christ, scripture teaches that you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living in me and is actually guiding me into a life shaped by his truth. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to jump to verse 6. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So so you needing to change is not you being condemned. It's God saying, I love you and I want more for your life. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are no longer bound by the law of sin and death. You are set free. You can get up and walk out of that old jail cell. 
The door has been left open for you. And then verse six says beautifully, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. God will guide me into a life shaped by his truth. I need to yield to him. I need to surrender to him. And hopeful idea number four, letting God lead my life produces the best outcomes. Letting God lead my life produces the best outcomes. And, and I could read literally the entire Bible to prove this to you, but I had to pick one verse for the sake of time. I'm going to make a point with it. Galatians 5, to 25. Some of you are probably familiar with this. I like the way that NLT, the, the New Living Translation paraphrases this. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. They have left those things for dead. They have chosen a life of change. Since we are living by the Spirit, I mean, since we're made alive by the Spirit, we're given new life by the Spirit. We're led into life and peace by the Spirit. Since we are living by the Spirit, without Him we are dead in our trespasses. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Letting God lead my life produces the best possible outcomes. I don't know about you, but my life is not perfectly defined by love. I hate to admit I am not joyful all of the time, especially before I've had coffee. <laughs> peace, peace has increased greatly in my life. I am so thankful for the way that God has increased peace in my life. Most of the time I experience peace, but sometimes I don't. I definitely don't experience patience all of the time. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you experience self-control all of the time? I want more of this in my life. I want to change. And thank God I was designed to change. And that if I will let him lead my life, he will produce the best possible outcomes. So how do we experience change? How to experience change. Number one, have a repentant heart. Have a repentant heart. I'm not going to ask who in this room is a Christian yet, but I need, need you to identify for yourself whether you are a Christian or not, because all the Christians in the room are about to turn their brains off because I'm going to share the gospel with you. But everyone in this room needs to hear it. This is, this is for all of us. You know, we, as much as we change, as much as we grow, as much as we experience progress, we never graduate from the gospel. The gospel is the most powerful truth that we could ever preach to ourselves. And you should be preaching the gospel to yourself daily. If you're going to experience change, you have to preach the gospel to yourself daily. So don't turn your brains off. Please listen to this. You have to have a repentant heart to change. And you have to recognize Romans 3.23. It says, Righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. In Acts 10, it says that God doesn't show favoritism or partiality. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If I'm going to experience change, I have to admit this of myself. I fall short of the glory of God. I can't be true to myself. I have to change. I have to make progress. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So all have sinned 
And what's a wage? Payment. Payment. It is something you earned in exchange for something you did. All have sinned, and the wage that you earned for that sin is death, eternal death, separation from God, even death on, on this earth, spiritual death, life apart from God. That is the wage for your sin, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a free gift offered to you, and all you have to do is choose to accept it. And this is the proof of God's real love for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I sinned, I earned eternal separation from God, and God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me anyways. While I was a still sinner. And I don't, I, I don't know about you, but I am still a sinner and it still encourages me that Jesus Christ died for my sin. Because there is often times that I feel remorseful and broken over my remaining sinfulness. And you know what I have to do? I have to preach the gospel to myself. I have to believe the gospel again. And that's why this is so important for you to experience change. Even if you're a Christian, every time you sin, you have to believe the gospel again. You have to recognize the truth of the gospel again. If you want to walk in victory in your life, I mean, that's like the pinnacle of change, victory in your life. You know, Jesus Christ already secured victory and it is not your victory, it is his. And so what do you do? You submit to him, which requires the humility of admitting that you need his grace, a repentant heart. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. No question about it. And I love the way that Acts 3, 19 says it, and this encourages me often. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That's the product of change, refreshment in the Lord. And what this really means, and this is the picture of repentance. You are walking one direction and God reveals it to you that you are going the wrong way. And so to experience change, you don't just keep going. You change directions. You turn to God. You have a repentant heart. Now, that, that requires acknowledgement that you are going the wrong way. It requires you acknowledging that you actually need to change. And it requires a willingness to change your actions, to turn around and to go the other way. And the product of that is that your sins are wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So if I'm going to change, I first must recognize my need to change. And along with that, I need to recognize that change has been made possible in the grace of Jesus Christ. And no matter my sin, the penalty has been paid and the free gift of change in Christ has been offered to me. And I can receive that gift again. To repent means that you change directions, which means that an unrepentant heart excuses and acts stubbornly and, and tries to get away with continuing to go the direction they were going, a repentant heart recognizes the need to change and then takes steps to see it through. Sometimes extremely practical steps to see that change happen. If you want to experience change, number two, be real with yourself. Not be true to yourself, be real with yourself and people that can help you. You got to admit that you're broken and that you need to change. And actually, you have to care more about progress than you do about people's perception of you. Does that make sense? I struggled with this probably more than anything when I was in college and for a few years after college. I, 
I mean, I, I experienced change. I experienced growth and, and God did some cool things through me because he works through broken people. I'm so grateful for all of that. But at the end of the day, I can look back on my entire time in college and I can see that change in my life, progress in my life, although it happened, it happened far, far less than it could have. Because there were things I was not willing to openly admit out loud to someone else. You wanna know why? Because I cared more about you thinking I was righteous than I did about actually being righteous, which is the very def definition of self-righteousness. And so that's why I so strongly encourage you, care more about making progress than you do about other people's perception of you. I mean, be real with yourself. Be real with some people that can actually help you. That means you have to be humble, which means you have to be humiliated in that moment of admitting something to someone who can help you. And it's worth it. And it's not a surprise to anyone. Anyone who's actually grown in godliness recognizes how much grace they have experienced from God and is happy to extend it to you. I promise you, if you are talking to someone who is 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 condemning and judgmental because you admit a sin in your life, they do not understand the gospel or accept it for you. If you deal with people, I mean, I'm thinking of the leaders in challenge, the people that I know in challenge, they've experienced the gospel for themselves and they will be happy to share it with you. And when you share something that's humiliating to you that you need help with, they will love you because Jesus Christ is enough for that sin too. And they're actually joyful about getting to help you experience that grace that they've experienced. But if you want to experience change, you got to be real with yourself and people that can help you. I got to fly through this section. First John 1, 5 to 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Be real with yourself. Be real with God. But if we walk in the light, out in the open, exposed, if we walk, out, walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And by the way, everyone else knows already. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Be real. Be real with yourself and with God. And, and what I don't mean is I don't mean walk around airing out your dirty laundry to everyone. That's just foolish. That's not helpful for anyone. What I mean is find a couple of very godly people. If you're a guy, find another guy. If you're a lady, find another lady. Someone who has a track record of walking with God, every single one of you needs to have at least one person who you will tell everything to. Actually everything. And if you do, you will experience change. James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, most of my life, most of my, I, I commit my life to Christ when I was 10 years old. And I have been familiar with this verse for more years than I'm willing to admit. I did not know what it really meant most of that time. <laughs> I mean, not until I was an adult. To be honest with you, not until after college. I didn't really understand this verse. I mean, truly understand this verse because I thought, well, if I confess my sins to God, he'll forgive me and he'll give me the power to change. So why do I have to go through the humiliation of admitting this to someone else? It is true God will forgive you if you confess to him. He is the one who offers you forgiveness. And in the way that he's designed change to work, he would like you to involve other people. This says, confess your sins to each other, not so that you can be forgiven. That happens when you confess your sins to God. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other 
so that you may be healed. If you want to experience change, you need to be real with some people who can help you. Righteous people that can help you and pray for you. I mean, there is supernatural power in this by the way that God's designed the universe to actually work. I could tell you countless stories of times that I withheld things from people. I wasn't willing to admit them. I was confessing them all of the time. I was re repenting all of the time, but I wasn't willing to admit them to people because I cared more about their perception of me than I did about actually becoming righteous. And then once I finally did, healing. I mean, miraculous healing. And you can experience that if you'll actually start being open and honest with some people. Number three, follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your life. If you want to experience change, follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your life. Have a repentant heart. Be real with yourself and people that can help you and follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your life. And this requires a couple of things. One, it requires that you talk to God, that you ask Him for help, that you ask Him for leadership. An example of what that might look like is found in Psalm 139, 23 to 24. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I can tell you confidently, every single time I have prayed that prayer, God answered me very quickly. If you want to experience change, follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your life. If you're going to do that, talk to God. Ask Him for help. Ask Him to lead you. Ask Him to show you how He wants you to change, the direction He wants you to go. And then number two to that, be sensitive to the voice of God. God wants to speak to you. We have a living God whose spirit is in us and he wants to speak to you. He wants to actively guide your life. He speaks to you through his word, through scripture. He speaks to you through other godly leaders. He speaks to you through prayer and worship. He, he speaks to you by prompting you. The Bible says convicting you and reminding you of truth. And I can tell you right now, when I'm sensitive, when I'm listening to God, there are all sorts of times in my day where, where I, I have a, a sense for something that is righteous. I guarantee you that did not come from me. And so if, if you're praying for God's leadership and you are actively listening to God's voice and then you're sensing a prompting to something that is clearly described in scripture, that's the authority, that's the test, you, you can be sure that that's God speaking to you. And a word on conviction versus condemnation. Conviction is such a grace of God. Conviction is such a loving thing from God. And you need to learn, if you're going to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your life, you need to learn to discern the difference of conviction versus condemnation. Uh, condemnation is that voice in your head that says things like, it's not that big of a deal, just do it again. You're never really gonna change, so why try? All your friends are doing it. Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Your feelings accurately reflect reality. You should, you should do that. Condemnation says things like, you could never change. You're never gonna be more than this. In fact, if someone is telling you to change, they're being hateful. That is condemnation. Conviction says that was wrong. Go this way. In the strength that God provides and in the grace that God provides, you have what it takes. You can avoid temptation. You can look to the example of Christ. You can follow what scripture says. Here's a reminder of what this verse says. Here's another reminder of what this verse says. That is conviction. And that's the voice that you listen to, is the voice of God convicting you and reminding you of truth. And I'll close with this encouragement. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27 says, I will give you a new heart. Talk about change. 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a heart of life. I will put my spirit in you. And I love this. I will move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. I don't know about you, but I want to be moved by God. I want the push of God in my life. I want the push of God in my growth. I want other people to get to see momentum in my life and to say, hey, I want to go that fast too. And this is so encouraging me that God can do that in me as I follow his leading in every part of my life without withholding anything. Progress is found in the promise of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. So my encouragement for you is today and again, tomorrow and again, the next day, give your life to God again. And let him lead you to become who you were created to be. Embrace a life of change. Pray with me. God, I thank you so much that you do not condemn us to who we are today, but you promise growth, you promise change. And in that, we get to experience hope and joy and peace. We get to experience the same power that raised Christ from the dead alive in us, making us alive in that same way. You ultimately raise us up to live at a level of glory similar to his in eternity. And I pray that we would embrace that process of change that is meant to take place every single day from now until then. I pray that we would be excited for the opportunities that we have to repent and to change and to respond to your conviction and reminding in our hearts. I pray that we would surrender to you daily, that we would accept the gospel daily, and that through all of this, there would be such an, an a, an extreme overflow of your work in our lives that others around us would come to glorify you as well. We pray for this in Jesus' name, amen.